Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom. And we're talking about liberty today, what it is, what it isn't, where it comes from, etc. With this, as with many other things we've talked about on this podcast, we need to take this back to the triune god. Uh, any conversation about liberty needs to have a definition, and to have a definition, we have to have a metaphysics and an epistemology. So, Greg, why don't you take it away and <laughs> tell us how the triune god is the source of liberty as he is the source of everything else we've talked everything about on else, this podcast. Yeah. You know, one thing that we do keep doing is coming back to God as the starting point for everything. And even if in the long run, some of our conclusion are off base, if we can just simply encourage people to go back beyond human reason and human experience and human tradition and look at God as he's revealed in scripture and consider him the archetype and the creator, the starting point for everything, we will have accomplished something in our small lifetimes mm -hmm. it will be worth it all. Uh, when we look at God, we look at absolute freedom. God is who he chooses to be because he absolutely delights in himself. He is absolute perfection. He does not need to make resolutions, grow up, change, see a, psych a psychoanalyst or any such thing. He is perfect joy, perfect beauty, perfect harmony, uh, and perfect freedom. He does as he will. Mm. Um, Our Lord is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. He has done whatsoever he has pleased. And, and no, ultimately, no other deity in the history of philosophy and religion can make this claim. All, we've talked a lot about the idea of the continuity of being, which ultimately traps all other expressions of reality, all other would-be deities within the framework of that being. Mm -hmm. And they, too, simply become corollaries or extensions of the universe that we all move in and that we all perceive. Their freedom isn't absolute any more than man's freedom is absolute. Only God can claim absolute freedom. Now, of course, you could say, but wait, he's not free to be other than himself. <laughs> Since other than himself would be imperfection, that does not seem to be a problem. Although I'm sure somebody someplace have thought of it as such. Well, I mean, you can think of the the argument. It's not even, it's barely an argument. It's, you know, could God make a rock right. so big that he couldn't lift it? Well, no, since that's not consistent with the nature of infinity. Yeah. It's, it's like, it's not, congratulations, you thought of something stupid. Yeah. Continuing. Well, and, I mean, and, and, and in many ways, that's the answer. No, because he's not stupid. Right. Um, he, his will, he, the children's catechism, can God do all things? And the answer isn't yes. The answer is he can do all his holy will. Mm -hmm. God can do as he pleases. He he does not please to contradict himself. He does not deny himself. There is in him no variableness or shadow caused by turning. He is completely self-consistent, self-coherent. And, and when we introduce or, or begin to look at God as Trinity, we don't have any problems there either because God is one. He's um, metaphysically or ontologically one God, one essence. And the three persons there are complete, are in complete harmony. Uh, the Father begets the Son and uh, as his own image and delights in the Son. The Son rejoices before the Father. They breathe forth the Spirit one to another in perfect joy and, and satisfaction. And there is even in this shared communion and community still perfect freedom. Each does as he pleases because each wills what the other wills. Mm -hmm. And this is love. There's, there's perfect love here, and perfect concern for each of the others, transparency, <clears throat> communication. This is God. This is not creation. <laughs> and so cr Christianity, in drawing this line and saying, here's God, he is freedom and love and beauty and glory. And then there's creation, which in and of itself is none of these except insofar as it submits itself unto God. God made creation as his reflection, particularly he made man as his image, as, as his analog. And insofar as man submits to the realities and parameters that God has prescribed for his creation, man too experiences freedom. But here's the thing. It's not an absolute freedom. It's not an autonomous freedom. It's not, I can do whatever I want. 
I mean, honestly, try that. I want to fly. I will jump off the Empire State <laughs> Building. You will not fly. <laughs> I, I, I want to conceive a child all by myself. I want a virgin birth. Go for it. It won't work. I want to live without eating any kind of food in any way, shape, or form. It, you're going to die. We, there are all kinds. You can go down the list of all the things where we say, but I want to. And reality says, no. Too bad. <laughs> Too bad. And, and there are... There are consequences for denying the way, rejecting the way that God runs the universe. Um, our secular friends speak of the laws of nature. We speak rather of God's providence. But in a certain extent, we can at least agree that things that, that fall off the Empire State Building, at least until they reach terminal velocity, fall at the rate of 9.8 meters per second per second. And when they hit the concrete below, they stop suddenly. And all of that pressure goes in all kinds of directions that basically turns things to mush. That's the scientific word. <laughs> um, and it's inescapable. We can't say, I don't want that to happen. I will fly. I will be free. I will not be bound by the constraints of this universe. And God says, um, yeah, you are too. Whether we talk about physics or biology or, say, economics, a whole nation of people decide that debt is prosperity <laughs> and they will monetize their debt and thus escape all economic crises in the future. It doesn't work <laughs> because that's not the way God runs his universe. So although there are there have been a lot of people who have spoken of a freedom just to do whatever you want and anything that gets in your way is some kind of tyranny, the first thing we have to realize is it's not realistic, and, and any little experiment can prove that real fast. Until used the phrase, he was, wasn't the first, but I think of him when using the, the word analogical to describe mm. any attribute of God that is shared with humanity. We experience it not in the same way that God, the creator, the uncreated being, experiences mm. it. Everything that we know as freedom is only freedom by analogy to God's freedom. And it's true, but it's an analogy. It's not absolute, as you said. You know, and, and we can look at the the definitions of freedom that people have come with come up with over the last well, several thousand years. Aristotle, mm -hmm. man is a political animal. Liberty is in the life of the polis. Do exactly what you're expected to do for the sake of the polis, no matter what that requires of you, and you will be free. By definition, whether you like it or not, whether it makes you happy or not, that is what freedom is, conforming to the life of the polis. With uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, it's the general will, which isn't too far removed from Aristotle, <laughs> for that matter, because the general will is not the um, democratic vote of everybody. It's the the consensus of the leadership, the intellectual elite, who tells you what your freedom is and you will submit to it or you will be forced to be free, as Rousseau taught us. You can you can think of Karl Marx and freedom. Freedom consists of the shortening of the, he says one place, of the shortening of the work day. <laughs> uh, really? All this bloodshed, all this massacre, so you can have a shorter work day? That was it? That's all you got for us? But of course, it means also the abolition of private property, of marriage, of institutionalized religion, and everybody having to work to provide for everybody else, which we will do so cheerfully because our natures will somehow magically be transformed. But there's freedom. And even when we look at Islam, where freedom is the submission of the world to the will of Allah, Allah himself is simply an extension of the universe. And that would take some argument to show but from a consistently Christian point of view, there's no alternative. He's not the creator God. He is not self-sufficient. He's not triune. He creates the universe out of necessity, and therefore it is. he's a corollary to it and it to him. And whatever he commands and produces is simply, again, the universe stirring the pot within itself. Same thing with pantheism. All of these things have offered freedom, and, and they've borrowed in the process a lot of Christian language and lingo and idioms to make it sound really cool. The Marxists have been great at this. The progressives in our generation were really great at sounding like they really want you to be free. But largely what it comes down is to free to practice 
your sexual perversion without government interference and to experiment with mind altering drugs. Aside from that, you don't get to do much <laughs> because we're going to take most of your money and we're going to use it to make sure that uh, there's no coming back from this situation. Well, it's not something that any other generation would have called freedom, but it sounds convincing in sound bites uh, played out on um, social media. There's an interesting linguistic shift in the past century or so where we talk a lot more now about freedom from things. Mm. We've got gluten-free, we've got sugar-free, we've got freedom from fear, freedom from want. And that supermarket parlance is <laughs> so pervasive. Like sugar-free means there's no sugar. It's not you're free to eat all the sugar you want. Right. It's the exact opposite. I don't remember if that was something Orwell touched on in 1984. I, I have know, a, he, a vague bell ringing in the back <laughs> of my mind. Yeah, it, it would have been worthy of him to be sure. I mean, the, the whole idea of rewriting the dictionary to justify existence and to justify government policy is is, is hardly new. And it is something you, you started out by, by saying that if we're going to talk about liberty, we need definitions. This is something that my wife and I were talking about just, just last night, the need... And here's a good recommendation. The need for catechisms and confessions mm -hmm. to just define basic terms. Who is this God person anyway? As Douglas Adams might ask. <laughs> uh, what, what, what do you mean by providence? What, what do you mean by law? What do you mean by liberty? What do you mean by salvation? What do you mean by love? There's the big one in this generation. If we have no definitions, we're, we're easy victims for people who just pick it up as an empty banner. As Francis Schaeffer would say, and wave it around. And we feel committed by our, our Christian commitment to follow that banner because Christians love everybody, right? And that's what we're called to. Brian, did you want to say something? <laughs> no, just just physically reacting like, hmm. <laughs> Well, it's sort of like, you know, if you, if you don't have a definition for love, mm -hmm. then even the golden rule doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Because if if you're just if it's oh just love one another as you love yourself, well, what if you hate yourself? Yeah. Or what if you think love involves uh, physical harm because your your mind just thinks that way? It it's yeah. messed up. Like no, <laughs> <laughs> there has to be a, an objective definition of love to work from, or else it, it, that that even even the most basic simple command that even the world likes to acknowledge in words falls apart. Yeah, the, the assumption seems to be, well, you all know what love is, but the answer is no, we don't. Uh, pick any random group of people who happen to be standing nearby and say, you, sir, how would you define love? You, ma'am, how would you define love? And very quickly, you'll start running into either incoherent definitions, things that turn in on themselves and don't go anywhere or into very different kinds of definitions uh, that may involve um, you letting me, you not only letting me, you enabling me to be exactly what I want to be as I perceive my best. And if you're not doing it, you're selfish and um, obviously a political conservative, probably Republican, because, <laughs> you know, people who love each other would fund my sex change or my abortion or my drug habit or whatever, because they want me to be what I want to be. Um, and these are the kind of things we run into so easily, even among Christians, I find. Certainly Christian young people, and I suspect Christian adults as well. It's just come to mean something like total acceptance to the point of footing the bill for other people. And if you question anything, question someone else's lifestyle, life preferences, then you're obviously hateful, evil, a uh, persecutor, and stupid. And I think your that mind, especially your mind is not enlightened. Yeah. I think that especially applies to women today that if if a man loves me he will enable me to be who I want to be. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you turn that around it becomes clear how bad of a definition that yeah. is. <laughs> and I I'm not saying, you know, that's the love that men should experience either. I'm saying that's a bad definition altogether. <laughs> All right, but it is a very common one, and, and, and you're right, I never thought about it. Just turn it around and say, 
Well, and if you love me, dear, no, it doesn't count you're a man. It doesn't work that way for men. <laughs> Where is that written? You're arguing. You obviously are not sympathetic to, you know, and it just everything starts snowballing into verbal assault that's illogical and irrational mm -hmm. because I get what I get. And anybody who challenges that on any level or belongs to a group that I perceive as challenging it, males, Mm -hmm. uh, whites, blacks, um, Asians, whoever, educated, not educated, these people obviously form at least a, a segment of society that needs radical reform and more likely uh, a self-conscious uh, enemy who needs, well, electroshock or something to blast them out of their, um, their mindset um, or something. Well, we'll, in the next 10 to 20 years, we will see what that something is. We'll see how far the progressives go in demanding that those of us who don't agree with them have our thinking readjusted. And, and, it, uh, and isn't get, it so exactly. weird? Isn't it so weird, too, how, uh, for the most part, you know, you, you, you get these people who currently are on the fringe saying, well, obviously, we'll need to have some sort of re-education camps for Trump supporters or conservatives in general or whatever that I don't like uh, to mm -hmm. go to. Um, but then they're also incensed, horrified at the idea of electroshock treatment to counteract homosexual impulses. For the record, mm -hmm. I'm not really in favor of either of no, these things, no, it's but not a, the, it's the not intense irony of, oh, of right. being completely uh, horrified, and it, it is, it's just a double standard, and double standards abound on both sides of, this, <laughs> of any issue, but um, it's just, yeah, that's, that's one that I immediately thought of as you were talking about that. Um, well, in terms of, I'm, I'm looking over my original discussion of this material. And interestingly enough, I see that what follows uh, falls into five categories. No and way. Is, <laughs> and this is what? not an accident. <laughs> Actually, we've already talked about the first, the source and origin of liberty is God himself. And we begin by understanding who God is. But then we, the, the second point, and for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, we're talking about covenant thinking. Once you've established God as the source and origin, the archetype of all reality. Then you have to look and see what God has done. We can look both at the world around us and specifically look at the world around us through scripture. And we find that God has put us in a world full of relationships. We have a relationship to the planet. We have a relationship to our own families, the family that begat us, uh, the one we create by marriage, the children we bear. We have friendships. We have employers or employees or people we work with. We have people we go to church with and we have commitments to. We have a community, a civil community, a neighborhood, a town, a city, a state, a country, a nation. And these are all givens. We don't, we're not given a vote before we're born. There's no checklist. What, what's the, the, the recent Pixar um, thing about souls? Oh. It's yeah, called soul. soul. It's called soul. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, we don't get that kind of preparation. Mormon theology may allow for, but biblical theology <laughs> doesn't. And so we're not given a checklist of what would you like to do? Where would you like to fit in? What kind of gifts would you like to have? What do you want that's going to set you apart? What country? What hair color? Um, what do you want your, your father to do for a living? None of that is anything that we are asked about or get get any kind of vote on. God just plops us into this. And family, God is already defined in scripture as how that works. Church, civil government, these have biblical definitions. Friendships being an analog also of our relationship to God comes with some with some severe limitations. Tick off all your friends regularly and you won't have them anymore. <laughs> I mean, this is not a hard thing. And then, it's not, and then we can go on and talk about economics and the market and all, all kinds of relationships that God imposes, that God ordains, that God has structured and that God has described in large part in his word. And if we want freedom, we have to play by the rules. And that's not oppression. That's not tyranny. That's freedom. Mm -hmm. Some theologians have written uh, 
a fish is most free when it's in a river, not sitting on a tree. <laughs> or a um, railroad engine is free when it's on the tracks, not when it's going over the Sahara. <laughs> the The boundaries are the things that generate the freedom. We learn to, we learn how marriage works, and it's a wonderful thing. We learn how church fellowship works, and it's wonderful and contributes to our own growth and the growth of others. The freedom that exists within a civil society of not stealing each other's property or lying about one another or about the goods we're trying to sell to one another. A wonderful opportunity for growth and prosperity and obtaining new and wonderful things. But if we challenge those, if we break God's commandments, we'll soon find we don't have any friends. We don't have a family anymore where we've been excommunicated from our church and the civil authorities are looking for us <laughs> with, the, with the goal probably of incarcerating us indefinitely. <laughs> after we've, you know, eliminated, after we've eliminated a few people who were in our way with, uh, you know, some bloody manner. <laughs> so th this is the second part of, of covenant life. God structures reality and we deal with that. And that brings us right immediately into the third, which is to oh. say boundaries. Do you want to say something? Yeah. Uh, about relationships. I was yeah, reading ahead. recently Kurt Vonnegut's book, Cat's Cradle, mm -hmm. which... I might recommend depending on who you are. It's not an <laughs> unqualified recommendation. Um, but one of the questions that he asks in a really fascinating way is, what is it that binds people together? Hmm. And the character that you're following through this book kind of sneers at the superficial connections of like, I grew up in Indiana, you grew up in Indiana. Why does that mean we have anything to do with each other? That's kind of a stupid idea. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, he's got this idea that there's this inexplicable fate that certain people are bound <laughs> together by uh, the role that they serve in this inscrutable world that's unfolding. And it's it's kind of in, you know, incoherent, as they say, but it was it's a real question. And there are real knowable answers. And it was very frustrating to me that I couldn't be like, Kurt. These are the answers. You're throwing them out the window. Stop it. There is uh, an episode of Babylon 5 where our heroes are interrogated by a character who turns out to be Jack the Ripper at the very end. Mm. Um, but the question he keeps asking them is, who are you? And it's the, the it's something similar to what you've described because the, well, I, this is my name. This is my my family and my father. No, that's your name is just a title. Who are you? No, that's a relationship. Who are? And probably the idea is that we're supposed to look at our core values or something like that. I'm not even sure what the the, the point here was. But um, who are you? And, and it's um, it's originally taken from the Lord of the Rings, where uh, Aragorn and um, Gimli and Legolas are crossing Rohan, trying to catch up with the, the hobbits and the orcs that took them. And the writers of Rohan come sweeping by and circling them and challenge them. And the question is, come, who are you? Whom do you serve? Mm -hmm. Which is very much a question about relationship. It is not amiss to say, I am married to Kate Uttinger. I am a member of the Reformed Church of the United States. Uh, you two and others I could name are my friends and associates and colleagues. This does define who I am. This is not, oh, these are just externals. What's really important is what you knew. No, 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 no. This, God puts us in these relationships mm -hmm. and these relationships make real claims on us and are in, in good part our identity. The church we belong to does define who we are and therefore choosing, changing churches is not a light thing. Mm -hmm. This is changing families is not a light thing, whether you're <laughs> you're leaving your family to get married for the first time or whether you're pondering divorce. You're, you're talking about your basic identity you're about to change. And it is it is worth uh, deep consideration. And, and we need to be sure that we do these things in the fear of God in terms of his word. And again, that brings us to the third point, which is simply discussion of the law of God in all of its broadness. In all, uh, David says, I'll, I'll walk at liberty because they keep your commandments. Your commandments are exceeding broad. It's not a narrow tight rope up. Well, you only got so many choices here. <laughs> Be careful, God's gonna smack you. It's okay, you're not committing adultery, stealing or killing people. 
it's you're probably all right then. <laughs> but I, I I want to invent a new process that that may make me millions or may leave me broke. Go for it, okay. But I can marry this beautiful girl or that beautiful girl. Oh wow, life stinks. Make a hard choice. Be a man. <laughs> You know, you, you get this, but what if I choose wrong? There's this circle of God's law. If you're within it, it's not a wrong, which that is to say, not an immoral choice. Now you need to act in faith, and it's more than just the letter of the law, to be sure. But, mm -hmm. you know, this is something a lot of people really struggle with, uh, particularly in the light of, um, you know, and again, Brian, you might want to address this, the old Pentecostal fine and, and, and holiness movement, find the perfect will of God. Mm -hmm. Because if you miss it, you can never get back on that track again. And how do you find it? Because it's hidden in God's secret counsels. It's not something, it's not really a matter of reading scripture and doing what the Bible says and making sure your choices are in conformity. You're trying to read the mind of God and you start asking for signs and such. Does that ring a bell with you at all? Oh, yes. <laughs> I forget exactly which epistle it's in, but there's, you know, when scripture speaks about, you know, you will find that which is uh, the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Right. Where pretty much for all of church history, everyone said, oh, okay, these are three adjectives towards the one will of God. Right. The Pentecostal movement basically splits it up and says, all right, so there's a good will and there's an acceptable will and there's a perfect will. And you really <laughs> oh, no. have to find that like, you got to be careful because like, yeah, there's the good will, but it's not as good as the other ones. It's like and a B. B minus. Then there's the acceptable will. It's like, yeah, you're on C grades here, but it's fine. You're, Jesus is covering that for you. And then there's the perfect will, which is like, this is the best. You were so in, in tune with spirit and everything was great. And it just really, as you might imagine, is a, a very big source of anxiety. Oh, um, absolutely. Undue anxiety yeah. where it's like, wow okay like every every single step you're just wondering okay is this the is this is this one that's going to take me out because like i want to be in the perfect will what am i what am i doing what if yeah. i what if i step wrong what if what if this happens and i end up somewhere else and i'm not able to be used by god in the way that he wants me to be used because obviously we can thwart things like that and <laughs> it's it's just a mess. <laughs> i have there's no other word for it it's just a mess <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it is a real thing. And, and those of us who didn't grow up in those circles, it may seem a little weird, but I've, I've had enough students from enough different traditions that uh, I've seen it. And it's it, it can be very frustrating. It can be very oppressive. Of But how do I know this is God's will? What, uh, can I throw out a fleece? No, you can't. No. <laughs> you have the Bible. But... You know, chocolate or vanilla, my, 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 whether or not I find the perfect will of God may depend upon it. No, it really doesn't. It's, which one do you like? Well, chocolate, personally. Pick the chocolate. <laughs> I, can, I can pick something I like. Isn't that like, like worldly somehow? It's following the lust of my flesh. Yes. So <laughs> therefore, I should. It's making my do... God my belly. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> um, <laughs> So back to the the boundaries that God actually sets for us are exceedingly broad and, and provide all kinds of opportunities, things we can like, things we can enjoy, things we can profit in, things that are a blessing to other people. But where God has spoken and drawn a line, the lines are sharp. Thou shalt not commit adultery means exactly what it says. It doesn't require any skill in hermeneutics to figure that one out. That God rejects homosexuality as sin is very clear. Uh, killing babies in the womb is wrong. It's murder. The, the Bible is clear about these things. And that in our generation, so many people should be so near those boundaries is in itself amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, we, wh why are we constantly encountering people who want to kill their babies? It's it's this weird thing. When I was younger, we heard about abortion. We knew it was a thing. But we didn't know people who actually did it. It was, you know, maybe something happens in those big dark cities and back alleys, but, and and now we're finding more and more that we actually have to wrestle with Christian people, people who claim to be Christians who go to church, about whether or not they should kill their babies or adopt an alternate lifestyle that involves something that the Bible has labeled perversion. We, we, we like to play near the boundary lines because we're a rebellious people. I'm reminded of a pastor who's a, 
kids said, uh, Dad, can, can we go outside? Okay, you can go outside, but you have to stay on this side of that line over there. Okay. And he looks out a little while and all of them are standing right on the <laughs> line the whole time. We seem to be in a generation like that where mm -hmm. some things that in, when I was a kid, that uh, hypothetical problems, sure. Moral dilemmas in the abstract, sure. But real things you actually had to talk to people about because they were about to do them? No. Society has changed dramatically in the last 50 years and probably will accelerate in those changes because we've used up most of our Christian capital. People don't believe even superficially in Christian principles and Christian morality anymore. And therefore, they don't believe in freedom. What they see as freedom is slavery, it's slavery to sin, to addictions, to sexual lust, to sexual diseases, to death, to the will of the majority, lest we cross them with our political incorrectness. Uh, it, this, is, this is a world of bondage, far more than what I grew up with. Mm -hmm. Well, that brings us to the cross. That brings us to the mm -hmm. fourth point. How, where does freedom come from? Freedom comes from Jesus Christ. Uh, if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. We need our sins forgiven, which means we have to admit we have them, uh, and that God defines them, not us. And when we find forgiveness in Jesus, then we also find the power of the Spirit to stop sinning, not perfectly, but substantially, to grow in grace and to turn from progressively more and more of the corruption that has enslaved us. And we're not perfectionists. We're not, um, you know, take, get the second blessing and you'll never sin again. But neither are we antinomians who say, well, your sins are forgiven. Go live any way you want. Because that's not freedom. Mm -hmm. It's not freedom to tell somebody your sins are forgiven. But this thing that's been driving you crazy, you're just going to have that forever. Because there's no real help in Christ for that. And it's, he doesn't even want to help you with that. I mean, well, maybe... If you get really serious and want some kind of special extra grace experience down the road, sure, you can make Jesus Lord of your life. You can have some kind of second blessing, but just be happy you're going to go to heaven when you die. Whereas the gospel represents itself as a new creation, the, the imparting of a supernatural fruit through the Holy Spirit so that we become new people with a new lifestyle, new character rooted in the resurrection power of Jesus. And when this happens to a people, a community, a nation, then freedom becomes possible. But to try to do it the other way, to come from a purely political or statist or militaristic approach and say, we will make you free, obey us and keep these rules, is to engender bondage and hatred and internal warfare and slavery. Because telling someone be good doesn't make them good, doesn't empower them to be good. And simply becomes, um, on the one hand, a path of frustration. On the other hand, uh, a cloak for doing all kinds of nasty things in the back, in the closet, in the back alley, uh, in the basement, that are destructive. And this is true whether you do it in the name of Christ or you do it in the name of some other religion. Mm -hmm. I was having a conversation several years ago with a friend about Jane Eyre, the book. Mm -hmm. um, and this friend didn't like the book because in his view, morality for Jane was a boundary that kept her from doing something she wanted to do rather than the driving force of her character, mm -hmm. which I see, except that it leaves out the gospel, mm -hmm. that the central driving force of Jane's character is not morality because morality is a bad engine for your character. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, the driving force of the character of Jane Eyre is the gospel of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I've come back to that book and wrestled for a long time with that argument um, before reading it again. And no, it's a great book. Everyone should read it. It's about the gospel. <laughs> <laughs> I think my wife would agree. It's her favorite book. That, uh, and that leaves us with the fifth point. Uh, the heritage of liberty, to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Well, you know, constitutions and declarations and legal codes play a part in that. But ultimately, what we're transmitting is a covenant way of living. We're, we're, we're passing on the gospel. We're, we're inviting 
our descendants, our children and grandchildren, great-grandchildren, to believe in the God that we believe in, to serve Jesus Christ, to trust him, to be the source of our morality, to change us from the inside out, and to cover our sins with his blood. And when a nation continues to act this way, it will find itself progressively free from fraud and theft, including by the government, from the attempts to create a welfare state, from laziness. People will want to work. They'll want to rejoice in God's creation. They'll want to create new things, new products. They'll want to bless their neighbors by providing them useful services as opposed to bogus services like prostitution and drugs. And you will end up with a very productive society. And, and yes, you, you need some legal structure there, but the legal structure can't bear the weight of generating a liberty. Mm -hmm. um, and we've, we've tried that over the last couple of centuries where we've taken, or someone's taken, the U.S. Constitution and tried to impose it on a different culture. It was tried in Mexico. It was tried um, just before the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia when Prince Lvov was um, in control for a little while. And it just doesn't work. It doesn't work simply to have this, these rules and this structure because they're, they're a reflection of the character and history of the American people uh, and reflect uh, what was at one time a deep commitment to righteousness, to morality, as defined by scripture, to hard work and to not messing with other people, letting them be themselves, mm -hmm. e even where it was far from perfect. Even where the faith was not clear and dominant, still, even the echoes and the backwash was enough to give America a certain amount of political freedom and economic freedom that startled the world and continues to be something amazing. And although there are things we could repent of and apologize for, yet overall, the tendency of American history, because of its roots in the gospel, has been more positive than negative. Some people may not may think that's faint praise, but compared to the Roman Empire or the Greeks, it's actually pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the root of this is these are not political problems, and so a political answer is yeah. not going to solve them. And I think conservatives are some of the most guilty of trying to solve problems with policy that are not political problems. Like the love of family is not going to be generated by a policy that supports strong families. This is a value problem. Yeah. yeah, Augustus tried that one when he was uh, ascending the throne, as it were, although he technically never did. But, you know, <laughs> he, he actually not only encouraged families to have more than two children, but actually was offering economic incentives because he and the Roman people generally recognized that if we don't start having more kids who are Romans by descent and by law, we're going to be hiring mercenaries. We're not going to have a tax basis. We're not even going to be able to have senators who are Romans setting our laws. We're going to turn our future over to other people. And they saw the problem. <laughs> they still didn't want to get married and stay faithful and have kids. So along came Christians and started adopting kids that they found outcast beneath the aqueducts and such. It's, as you say, it's a value issue. So whom do you love? Whom do you serve? Who are you? These are real questions that we need to, we have to face and we have to ask ourselves. Does that about cover it? <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments on Liberty? No, I'm done. <laughs> Let's wrap up with some recommendations. I got one. Yay. The problem, my problem is I forgot to keep writing them down when I uh. think of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is one I'm currently reading. I started reading it a long time ago and, then put, and, and, and liked it, but put it on a shelf and never got back to it. Uh, it's a history book. And therefore, if you don't really like history, you might not be interested. One thing it has going for it is it's written by Terry Jones, who was one of the players in Monty Python. I thought I recognized well, that name. <laughs> he was one of the co-directors of uh, Holy Grail. Hmm. So, and it, it comes out a little bit here and there, but what I didn't know... <laughs> uh, actually, I didn't know until just a minute ago when I checked Wikipedia, um, although I could have deduced from this book, is that he is also, or was, he just passed away, uh, a very well-respected historian as well. And it sounds like his other books are interesting. This book is Who Murdered Chaucer, a Medieval Mystery. And since I haven't finished it, I won't give away what I suspect the ending may be. 
But the section I just read is so appropriate to right now that I, I just want to sum it up as fast as I can. The title includes Chaucer, but this is also, and I, I mentioned this to my wife, and she said, you're kidding. Chaucer and Wycliffe lived at the same time. They knew the same people. And what was going on there was a shift from writing in Latin, which the common man could not do, to writing in English. Now, those of us who stand on the tradition of the Reformation get what that meant where Wycliffe's concerned. He's translating the Bible. His followers are translating the Bible. In addition to writing a great deal about theology and philosophy beyond the mere translation. But what it means more generally is that everybody, including Chaucer, was, was now writing in English, which the common man could read. You'd no longer require a university education to hear what people were thinking about politics or religion or philosophy or economics. Um, a lot of ideas that were just in the air. And of course, this is the Renaissance, which Professor John Green of Crash Course argues was not a thing. <laughs> he's he, he's on to something there. But I, I, I think I need to reevaluate him in terms of this book. Because uh, his argument is, well, when people did not wake up and when they say, uh, gee, uh, come and see the Renaissance is dawning all around us. <laughs> that may be true. And yet in England, there was a sheer marker, which was, I can now pick up a book mm. or a tract or a pamphlet and read about what intellectuals in, in Paris or Rome are talking about. And I can go upstairs with a bunch of my pals and play whatever their vision, version of checkers is and have a drink. And we can debate this. Mm. The level of intellectual conversation is being elevated in English. And yes, it's including religion, but it's including a whole lot more. And what the church at that point did, the institutional church, is to say, um, this is not safe. <laughs> we have always been the ones who have given the definitions and set the rules and the parameters of discussion. And, and we're going to get the same thing that, that Luther gets, you know, a couple generations later of, what if every plowboy starts discussing theology? Well, there are dangers there. Why don't you get ahead of the curve and teach them good theology? <laughs> Rather than say, no, this English thing has got to end. No more, te no more writing and talking in English. Even, and even if we examine you to find out if you're Orthodox, you're going to talk to us in Latin because we don't want these commoners around us to hear the nature of the debate and what your answers are. And more often, the, the so-called heretics would answer in English anyhow. <laughs> um, and so although Wycliffe got, got shut down by the official church, as in his official role, he goes, he has enough protection from the lords who belong to the peace party and retired of the Hundred Years War and wanted it to end, to go on writing and translating. And this, this birth of English is the birth of the ordinary man as the intellectual, as the guy who reads hard stuff and thinks about and talks over with his friends. It's a, it's a cultural transformation for England, and since most of our roots are there, it is very significant for us. So anyway, mm. the title again, Who Murdered Chaucer, A Medieval Mystery by Carrie Jones. English actors are so funny that way about uh, how much <laughs> they know about things. I had the privilege of hearing Tom Hardy speak once in college. Um, Tom Hardy, you might know him as Cornelius Fudge from the Harry Potter movies, oh, or yes, yes. you know who I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, he showed up at my school during finals week and gave a little talk, recited some of the Anglo-Saxon that he'd learned from Tolkien, you know, no big deal. <laughs> and, but it turns out he's also like a medieval weaponry expert. Like he, he was one of the foremost scholars on the longbow and all this stuff. It's like, I thought you were in movies, like go live a normal celebrity life. No, but it was fascinating to hear him talk. Brian, do you have a recommendation? I do, but I have to find what the... F I, I found this new channel on YouTube, which <laughs> is hilarious. And I need to find the first one that I, I, I saw from him. <laughs> yes. Okay. So it's it's a English gentleman named... And his, his channel name is Lindy Beige, which is... Lindy as in Lindy Hop and Beige as in the color. <laughs> oh. And... Um, <laughs> His very first video was a, a very odd rant, but I ended up agreeing with him by the end about the the pure insanity that in every Hollywood movie, whenever someone is tied up and they are let go from their bonds, they just cut the rope. He goes, no. He's like, 
uh, this is this is a, a span of rope that I made, and like in the subtitles it pops up. Well, sort of, and it's like <laughs> it took me a long time to make this. I'm not just going to cut it at the first opportunity. <laughs> right. This is I would untie it. It just takes like ten more seconds if you are an even barely competent knot maker. And <laughs> goes on and on talking about rope. And he's like this rope which I made almost kind of <laughs> every single time he mentions that. <laughs> Uh, and then I, I started watching other ones he did, and it's mostly about medieval technology. Like, um, he has one about how Scottish Highlanders would fight with a broadsword and targe. And then one video about fire arrows and why they are nonsense. Um, <laughs> why the movie scenes where they cast the sword in a mold that's open face <laughs> is dumb. Because it's <laughs> always in stone molds. It's like, yes. no, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. <laughs> that's not how any of this works. <laughs> exactly. And I, I really just enjoy it. And he's just... You know, a charming random British man on YouTube who talks about medieval technology, and I was like, I need to subscribe to this man right now. <laughs> so that's my recommendation, Mister uh, Mister Lindy Beige, whatever his real name is. Awesome. <laughs> my recommendation is the Disney movie Lilo and Stitch. Yes, I it's will. It's wonderful. Co-sign. We watched it for Valentine's Day. <laughs> it's about love and family, and it's very nice. Ugh. I, so, I cry, so honestly, like throughout the entire movie. <laughs> it's so good. And can we just say that like um Hawaiian roller coaster ride is a bop. Oh, so good. <laughs> so good. <laughs> yeah. So David had actually never seen it. He'd heard oh. it quoted. And like you know when you've heard a movie quoted a lot and you haven't seen it, you can kind of just like have an antipathy to it for that reason. I suspect that David had some of that, but he was very gracious and agreed to watch it because I liked it so much, and I think I won him over. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Oh, that takes care of it for this evening. Uh, thank you guys so much for this conversation. It's been awesome. Uh, thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband, and Lilo and Stitch buddy. <laughs> thanks also to our financial supporters. We really appreciate you helping us keep the show rolling. If you'd like to check out any of the resources we've mentioned, you can look at our show notes. We also have transcripts available. They are on our website, which is anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. And if you'd like to send us an email, tell us what you think. Um, halting towards Zion at gmail.com is our email address. We look forward to hearing from you. Have a good night. Thank you.